Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're discussing the Earth's climate and militarism and what Veterans for Peace is working on. Our guest is Vince Dionich, a veteran of what the Vietnamese call the American War. He is also a founder of the Climate Crisis and Militarism Project at Veterans for Peace. Vince also works with the Climate Reality Project and Sustaining All Life. Vince Dionich, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. So uh, you were a part of this uh, war quite some years back, and somehow you became anti-war, pro-peace. Uh, what happened? Um, <laughs> it's quite a story. I, I, I became pro-war because my dad was a leftist, and uh, him and I did not have a good relationship. So... Basically, everything he was against, I was for, and vice versa. Wow, you hear that story more often the other way, I think. The, the dad's to the right, and the kid yeah, goes well, to the was, left. He was, I, you know, it was like that. And uh, so I also, I mean, I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to work. Um, going in the army and, you know, going to war, you know, I bought all this romantic stuff about war that, you know, this kind of way that we're socialized as males, um, you know, and so I bought all this stuff. I, I wasn't, I wouldn't say particularly patriotic. I, I was more looking for adventure. Yeah. And, and I went, I went to Vietnam and um, in the infantry, I was in the 101st Airborne Division. Um, Spent way too much time in the jungle. Uh, it was so I probably three months or two or three months after I'd gotten there, I, I started thinking about what the heck am I doing here? You know, how did I get into this mess? What's going on? Um, I realized that you know we were over there basically helping the corporations out and making war on a lot of poor rural people. Most of the population at that time was rural. I mean, it was the first time I'd been outside the U.S. It was the first time I'd, you know, ever been in a, in a really poor country. You go out into the, you know, the small villages in the country, no electrician, no electricity, no plumbing, not even septic systems, not the stuff that we have here rurally. And a lot of dirt floors, thatched huts, and I said, "Why are we do? Why are we here?" You know, and and it, and it dawned on me. After a while, I learned that most of the people in the rural rural areas, and eighty percent of the people at that time were lived rurally, were tenant farmers, or you know, the U.S. equivalent of being a sharecropper, and yeah. their 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 lives were basically controlled by rich urban landlords who were completely against land reform. So I, I, began, I began questioning everything. Um, when, I, when, I got out of the, when I got out of the military, I, be, I became, I was, anti, I was firmly anti-war by the time I came home. I, yeah. I stayed in Vietnam a little longer than I had to, but by that time I had a desk job, more or less. And I, I didn't really want to come back and face college students with, my, with bayonets. So during the anti-war movement. So I stayed over there long enough so I could be a civilian when I came home. And then I got involved um, in Vietnam Veterans Against the War and worked in that, worked in that organization for a while. Um, during that time, I also, I, also became, I also became sort of an environmentalist. Um, I didn't have, the, I don't think any of us at that, that, that time really the early 1970s really had any understanding. Not even the scientists had figured it out by then. They didn't really figure out that, you know, we were in trouble climate wise until the late 1970s, where there was a report that a scientist wrote for Exxon that was suppressed for many years, which said, you know, we need to start doing something within the next five or 10 years, which obviously we hadn't done. Um, so I was in, I was in the anti-war movement. Um, I was, uh, I was later in, I was kind of later in other organizations that were trying to make social change. 
some yeah. of them the Marxist Leninist variety. Um, but I've, I've actually become very nonviolent at this point in my life, realizing that, you know, nonviolence is the only thing that is going to work to defeat militarism. And sometimes that means nonviolent direct action. Um, I, I started, I started, I retired from my job um, a few years back and I started, I joined Veterans for Peace initially in the early 80s. There was a predecessor organization in San Francisco that I was a part of and I joined Veterans for Peace. And I left in some ways because I didn't think there was much space for me. Um, at that time, I'd pretty much become a feminist and I believed that we needed to change ourselves to change the world. And we needed to do it. Part of what we need to do in our political work is not just change policies and laws, but change how we relate to each other, you know, based on, based on racism, sexism, classism, and all these different kinds of oppressions, which is, you know, a lot, a lot of work in and of itself. Um, but anyway, I, 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 I came back to Veterans for Peace, <clears throat> excuse me, and I wanted to do I wanted to do climate. I, I knew there was a lot of, I've been doing climate work, some with Extinction Rebellion, which I've kind of left at this point, uh, not with any animosity. It just wasn't a good fit for me. And I, I got involved with the Climate Reality Project, um, which is an organization started by former Vice President Al Gore. And they, they do a lot of climate training, all, you know, all over about how to do presentations on the climate crisis. And that's the kind of the main work. And there, there's the one in the Bay Area, we're also, we're also doing some racial justice, r racial and climate justice work. Um, so veteran, another, me and a, another veteran who I've known for many years in, in Veterans for Peace decided we wanted to do a, a, a workshop at last year's convention on climate. And we, we got, we, there, there was a lot of people, a lot more people showed up for that than we thought. And so there's turned out to be a lot of, um, a lot of enthusiasm to do this work, to work on climate. So we, we formed this group called the, the Veterans for Peace Climate Crisis and Militarism Working Group. And it was a working group and it became a project as opposed to a working group. And uh, Veterans for Peace is a 501c3 organization. So if we be... We're a working group. We can do what we want and put, publish papers and do anything. But if we're a project, we can get funded. We can raise funds to do our work and to do other things. And there was a lot of support in the organization for us to become a project. Um, and so we've been doing... We, so one of the first things that we actually started, we, we wrote... A lot of us... We're not, we're, you know, during, they're between August when we started this and, and the end of January, we're, we're distracted by the election and the campaigns. And a lot of us were doing a lot of work um, to make sure that we had a new administration. So after, after we, the administ we got a new administration and all of a sudden John Kerry, who some of us knew, not me personally, but some of us knew from the early days of Vietnam Veterans of War was named the special envoy on climate. So we thought we should, we should write, we should write envoy carry a letter and, and uh, get it to him and get a bunch of signers. So we, we wrote this letter and it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, over 300 organizations, peace and environmental organizations and prominent individuals throughout the world signed on to this. So, we we figured out how to get to his staff um and so they agreed to meet with us so we we had a meeting with his staff on last tuesday april the 20th i'm giving away the date when this is happening <laughs> this interview so that was before earth day and, and we met with them for a half an hour um initially the meeting was going to be an hour but they were very busy trying to plan for the the climate summit um, most of us who are climate activists were, I, I was personally, and I know other people that were, I, I know there's other people that are far more cynical. I'm kind of the glass full and some of the, most of them are the, you know, the glass is half full and some of them are the glass is half empty types. But I, I, I basically thought I was based pleasantly surprised by 
what the Biden's, Biden administration has done around environment um, so far. There, there's other ways I'm not as happy with them, but, you know, it has to do with their foreign policy stuff, um, which I'm not going to spend any time talking about because I'm sure you're going to probably have other people to talk about that. So we, yeah, we, we, wrote, we, we bash the, the foreign policy disaster that has been the Biden presidency thus far all the time. But let me let me play glass half empty cynic on the on the climate. Fourteen billion dollars uh, to help the climate sounds sounds tremendous. Right. If you are unaware that the U.S. government puts 20 billion dollars every year into fossil fuel subsidies, uh, not to mention, you know, uh, a thousand and a couple hundred billion dollars uh, into militarism. Uh, so how, give me the give me that glass half full report. It was more than any of us expected. You know, it was I, it's 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 a it's a baby step in the right direction. OK, I'll put it that way. It's maybe half a baby step. You know, it depend on I don't want to you know, I don't want to draw lines in the sand over it. But um there, there's things that, so, so that's one thing that happened, but there's, there's a lot of work to go. And the other thing about this climate crisis is those of us that have been progressive and leftist are used to, you know, for the most part, working within our comfort zones. We need to make a bigger tent than any of us has ever been in. I think we need to make a bigger tent than any of us has ever thought about we were going to be in to fix this. Um, the climate reality project, for example, is not something I would consider. It's very mainstream. There's a lot of business people that are in there. There's a lot of regular folks that never done anything politically in their life. Yeah. And, and, and that's who we need to bring in. That's the kind of group that we need to create to do this. Um, and I, I certainly I certainly want Veterans for Peace to do that. I mean, my personal goal and in, in doing climate work in, in Veterans for Peace are basically two. One was we have 120 chapters in Veterans for Peace. I want somebody in every chapter to be doing climate work, whether it's for Citizens Climate Lobby, 350.org, Extinction Rebellion, Climate Reality Project. I don't care. Do something, you know, just go out and, and, and do something because the the situation is that desperate that we, you know, we all need to learn how to talk to each other. Um, I also challenge people to go out and find somebody that voted for Donald Trump, make friends with them and find some common ground. I mean, as a, as a stretch goal, you know, um, some of us, you know, that were grew up working class have a lot of people that we grew up that did vote for Donald Trump. Sure. You know, and and that not they're not Trump voters are not monolithic, despite how we on the left and the media likes to portray them. You know, they're not. So there's so I think I think we need a bigger tent, like I said, than we've, we've ever been into. And so we wrote this letter to to um, Envoy Biden, I guess. Or I don't want to call your Biden. Carrie. We also hope that that Joe Biden gets to see the letter, too. We also um, have a petition that we were that has basically the same de- same re- asks as we're not making them demands we're calling them asks as we have of the letter. And if you go to vet, I'm going to say this slowly. You go to veteransforpeace.org forward slash take hyphen action forward slash climate crisis. You can find the letter that we wrote to carry and the petition to sign on. And the, the, the both of them have two, six things that we ask of, of carry. The first is um, to include military greenhouse gas emissions in all reporting and data on greenhouse gases. Now, the U.S. fought really hard to have military emissions excluded from the Kyoto Protocols and then we had the we had the gall to not sign the thing, at the end. So there there's certain there's not a just fought really hard, but succeeded, right? Yeah, yeah. We fought really hard. Um, and we wanted we ask Envoy Kerry to use his public platform to promote major reductions in the military and its expenditures, 
including eliminating hundreds of overseas bases, rejecting nuclear moder modernization and endless war. Now there's 800 bases that the United States has overseas. And um, I'm gonna digress, I'm gonna get, I'll get to point three in a bit, but um, one of the things about those, which we found out at the meeting, I didn't know this until we met with uh, the two Kerry staffers, that all those 800 military bases, they're not counted against the Pentagon's emissions. They're counted against the host country's emissions. And the Pentagon and the Department of Defense is the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases, the single largest user of fossil fuels. And despite what gets how this what the spin is, you know, national defense and we need to keep safe, most of the most of that stuff is about keeping the oil coming in from other parts of the world. So it's, you know, part and parcel of the fossil fuel issue, the, the problem. Has, so anyway, anybody, that, has anybody, Vince, tried to calculate if you could add the emissions of all the U.S. foreign bases uh, pockmarking the globe to the, the existing calculation of Pentagon fossil fuel emissions, what you would get? That's a project for us because I, I, I didn't find out about it till last Tuesday. I didn't know that that was true until one of the one of the staffers basically spilled the beans and said, oh, those those because they were they were going through these demands and we can talk to you about this. Oh, but you need to talk to the Department of Defense about that. Or, or they kept saying SecDef, SecDef. And I said, what's a SecDef? And they said, oh, we'll get you somebody at the Pentagon. Oh, that must be the Secretary of Defense. So that it was a, overall, it was I thought it was a positive meeting. Um, it seemed like they took our six points to heart, but we'll, you know, and I, I have very little experience meeting with government officials um, and, and congressional staffers and things like that. Most of my activism has been, you know, the old singing songs and carrying signs. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. So this is, this is new to me, but I, I realize that, well, I need, I need to read, I need to rethink my game because carrying songs and singing signs is not a big enough tent, you know, it's just not going to make it. Um, so anyway, um, let me go back to the demands. That was the number two was a long digression. Number three is that we asked him, we asked him to promote bilateral accords with Russia and China to stop funding fossil fuel projects and promote cooperation towards green economies. I mean, we just, it, ultimately we're gonna have to leave it in the ground, which is I think a scary proposition to a lot of people because it represents you know, a fundamental shift in the way that we've, what societies basically have done you know, for thousands of years is the acquisition of wealth, so-called, maybe unequally, but you know, like more roads, more schools, you know, more buildings and more stuff to, you know, more stuff to make you happy. It's like, you know, we've been in the, uh, the George Carlin zone. I don't know if you know that routine that George Carlin did. I got too much stuff, so I need a bigger place so I can keep all my stuff. Right. And after a while, I get more stuff, so I need a bigger place. What, what about an American <laughs> jobs plan? Let's build more stuff. That'll fix everything. Well, I, there's a, we have a job. There's, we, that's, that's, um, we have a demand that we have a ask about that too in this in this letter. So that was number three. Number four, um, fight for the U.S. to pay its fair share of the climate fund, which looks like it's probably going to happen, um, or at least on paper. Number five, promote a just transition with union jobs and prevailing wages for workers displaced from the fossil fuel and weapons industries, and for low wage workers. Um, I think we're, we didn't say it in this, but we're talking about, we, we think there needs to be a guaranteed income. And I don't think it needs to be for everybody in the country. I think it needs to be for everybody on the planet. And number six is view grassroots climate, environmental justice, and anti-war groups and al as allies and work with them as partners. Um, I basically thought um, in that meeting with the two staffers that we were treated that way. So I, so I, for my, from, for I, I was a positive experience and I, my life, I've gotten along better and not trying to, you know, second guess people or read between the lines. And 
my life goes better and my relationships go better if I take people at their word. And if I find out you're lying, well, then okay. But I don't think you'll get to burn me twice. So anyway, that, that was kind of um, what we did, you know, what, what it was. And, and we're also, so that's, that was that meeting and we're having a follow-up. We had, like I said, over 350 signatories, you know, like peace and justice organization, environmental organizations, and, uh, and climate organizations, some climate organizations. And again, if you go to the website veteransforpeace.org forward slash take hyphen action forward slash climate crisis you can find our petition and you can find the letter and i believe the signatures are attached to the letter as well so you can see you can see all of it um, if you print it out we've got like the letter is about two pages and then we got like nine pages of signatures Vince Dijanich, I know the organizations I work with signed on it immediately upon being asked. I'm curious if any big environmental organizations signed on Sierra Club uh, and um, Nature Conservancy, uh, no, 350.org no. you mentioned earlier. Did any of these groups sign that letter? 350.org did. Um, They're getting a little better, aren't they? Nature Conservatory said, well, that's kind of outside of our bailiwick. And I'm not sure what happened with Sierra Club. I know they were. I know they were asked. See, this um, is my my question for you. When I when I try to get peace activists to go work on the climate, I don't usually have any trouble at all. They're already doing it. A lot of them. Uh, but when I try to get environmental organizations, you know, not just the Kyoto Agreement to include military emissions, but the criticisms of the Kyoto Agreement by environmentalists to include mention of militarism, the Green New Deal proposals from the so-called progressives to include demilitarization. It, it's, it's really uphill, isn't it? There, there's, there's one significant struggle in that, in that thing that um, you're just gonna have to look them in the eyeball and say it. And what it is, is that these folks are nonprofits and they get funded for people. As soon as you talk about the military, people start withdrawing their money. And I, I think that that's kind of um, a hangover from, from, you know, September 11th, 2001. Um, and it's, and it's, I think there's a lot of education that's going to have to happen there that look, the military is, they say they're about defense, but what they're about is keeping the oil pipeline and the, tungsten and all this other stuff we need pipelines open so we can continue to extract resources from other parts of the world and keep them to keep the shipping lanes open to keep the air lanes open etc to keep the government to keep friendly governments in power etc etc and it gets couched as as quote national security but it's really it's really not about that and and i i think like i said you know there's one of the reasons that one of the th I, I like I said, I worked with Extinction Rebellion for a while and they have a kind of what I think is a, a fairly flawed theory, oh, more than wildly optimistic. And, and their, their kind of position is, well, if we can get three percent of the population to agree, that's enough to let leverage gigantic social change. <laughs> Not, not agree, but engage in concerted, uh, intense yes. activism making. Even, even, even three percent, you know. When I think we need, we need probably seventy percent of the ninety-nine percent, and at least fifty percent of the one percent to work to make this work, to make to really make a shift in long term. Because it's a huge shift. It's bigger than anything any of us has ever thought about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm thinking that 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 that. So I, I think that's a slow process of which is why we want to educate the climate movement about, you know, the, the role that the military plays. And and when we started doing this in August, we, we there's, the, there's nobody talking about climate. There's nobody talking about militarism and climate. Now, all of a sudden, we're finding all these other people that are starting to talk about it. So I, th I think it is is getting on the radar. I mean, the U.S. Air Force is the largest consumer in the world of jet fuel. Yep. You know, but it's still in the Department of Defense. If it were a country, it would rank 47th or 46th. 
not counting all its foreign bases. I that's what I want to know. And I'm thinking um, if, if we got that in, it might be 35th. We don't know. I mean, because that's to me, that's new information to me, and it's kind of I'm I'm curious. I'm curious to find that out. And I'm like, well, who would I who would who would who would I talk to about that? You know. <laughs> at at one point, some years back, I I read that that some two thirds of the of the fossil fuel consumption by the U.S. Army was for vehicles trans boarding fuel to the locations of wars. Uh, so, I mean, this, this is, that's, 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 that's probably accurate. Um, I, I don't know that. I do know that, you, you know, in, in cars you have, um, miles, miles per gallon, right? In, in tanks, it's the opposite. It's gallons per mile. Exactly. So uh, Abrams tank goes about a half a mile on a gallon. Yeah. So and and it, it, and those large jet transports, the ones that you could put three or four Abrams tanks in, they're like they're like point two five some point zero two five, you know, <laughs> gallon or miles per whatever it is, whatever the gallons per mile. They they consume a lot of gallons to go a mile. It, but and, it, do, it, and do absolutely nothing good in the process. Vince, well, we've got also, about a minute and a half left. If you wouldn't mind telling people uh, the website yet again and and how they can get involved and what they should be doing. Well, I, I what I'll tell people, I'll, let me say the website. It's veteransforpeace.org forward slash take hyphen action forward slash climate crisis. And there's there's a way to get involved with us there and i would just say get involved with any 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 climate organization that's doing work because they're they're all we all need to move in that direction and if there's some local issue that you want to get involved with and, and coalition join that and and keep abreast of the news we, we've got about one minute left now there if you want to mention another organization in your bio sustaining all life what is what is that one um, sustaining all life is a project of another organization called the International Reevaluation Counseling Community, and that's about healing from emotional damage. And we do workshops on that, um, how people feel about you know because it's pretty overwhelming. And I I find with most activists, unfortunately, they do the work and they suck it up and do the work, yeah, and, and wind up wind up having health issues later on, and. It's it's good to be able to slow down enough sometime to really actually smell the roses while there's still roses to smell, but it sustaining all life we have a set of skills that we offer to people to to learn to communicate with each other better and to, and to do emotional healing. Wonderful, I will share that with quite a few activists I can think of. We've been speaking with Vince Dianic, who That's is. Her. Uh, with, I hope I've been saying your name correctly most of the time, Vince Dionich with Veterans for Peace. Uh, go to veteransforpeace.org. Vince, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Well, thank you, David, for having me. I'm, I'll do it again if you want sometime. Sounds good. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.